Good evening, everyone. How you all doing tonight? Boy, pretty bad night, huh? All right. Let's the uh, the record reflect that the uh, San Diego City uh, San Diego. I did that again, didn't I? Yeah, I talk to those people all the time. And I can't help it. Especially working there for thirty years. So let's. How about if we try this again? <laughs> Let the record reflect that the city of Santee council meeting is called to order, and it's October eleventh, twenty twenty three. All council members are present. Uh, with uh, Ron Hall excused. So tonight we'll uh, have the invocation followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. And I think I'm going to have, let's see, John Hossett come up tonight and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Before we do that, though, let me uh, tell you who's doing the invocation. Tonight we have Timothy... I hope I get this right. Avazan? Avazan? Uh, Avazian. Avazian is the pastor at Lakeside Community Presbyterian Church where he has served the past three years. So let's ask the question, what is the history of the church? Well, Lakes, I found this interesting. That's why I'm reading it tonight. Uh, Lakeside was without a local church until the Presbytery of Los Angeles supported the commission and commissioned a new church. The first Presbyterian Church of Lakeside was organized. And the first workshop service was held on the front porch of the Lakeside Inn. The church had 13 charter members, and in 1895, the church membership membership had grown enough to begin constructing a church building on the corner of Main Avenue and Parkside Street. The first church service was held on February 9, 1896, and the old church is now home to the Lakeside History Society. Lakeside's Presbyterian Church started the victory bell that rang at noon on April 25th, 1918. The bell rang every day at noon seven times, one for each letter in the word victory, followed by a silent prayer for World War I to end. The practice of ringing the church bell was soon followed throughout the nation. The bell was also rung during World War II, Vietnam, our country's bicentennial, and the Gulf War. So Tim received his Master of Divinity degree at Fuller Theological Seminary and his BA at Azusa Pacific University. Tim has been an ordained minister for 30 years, serving churches throughout Southern California. During his time at the church, he participated in the 130th anniversary of the church this past March. Timothy's wife, Karen, is busy herself. She's a clinical psychologist with a private practice in Rancho Bernardo. They enjoy life in East County and have four adult children. We thank you for being here this evening. We ask you pray for the United States of America, the state of California, Santee, and this city council. Please join me by raising, uh, standing for the invocation followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Thanks for those good words, too. Kind words. Uh, Would you bow and pray with me? God of all people, we humbly come to you now and ask that you would be with us as we seek to serve and to lead this community. Lord, we ask that you, that we would be reminded that you are the giver of all truth and our desire is to seek your wisdom and your guidance as we deliberate and decide. May those on this council seek justice for those that are oppressed. May they be merciful as they make hard decisions that affect those on the margins, and may they walk humbly, knowing that they are seeking the greater good for those that they serve. Our prayer is not only for this city, but also for our nation, also for our state, for East County. Our desire is that this place would be a bit more like your kingdom, full of love, compassion, and grace. In this we pray. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, John.
We're also going to uh, open our special meeting tonight, which is actually a closed session meeting, and um, we'll report out on that after we're finished. Um, so uh, before we actually get started, there, I have something that um, I'd actually like to, to say in reference to the, um, what's happened in, over in Israel over the last uh, few days. I'm deeply concerned about the recent unprovoked attacks in Israel and their potential impact on our community. The ongoing conflict in the Middle East affects us all, whether we realize it or not, and we must understand its implications for our community. The unprovoked attacks in Israel have created a ripple effect that can be felt even here in Santee. As a diverse and interconnected community, we must recognize that many neighbors have strong ties to the region through family, cultural heritage, or personal relationships. The anxiety, fear, and sorrow generated by these attacks can resonate with our community as we empathize with those affected by the violence half a world away. Additionally, the instability in the Middle East can have broader consequences for us. Economic uncertainty, rising oil prices, and global tensions can impact the cost of living and the stability of our local job market. We must stay informed about these international events as they directly affect our daily lives. As a community, we are responsible for supporting one another during difficult times. Reach out to your neighbors, colleagues, and friends whom the Israel situation may directly or indirectly impact. Extend your empathy and understanding in offering a listening ear to those needing it. Let us unite as a community, showing that Santee stands for peace and unity. The unprovoked attacks in Israel remind us of the interconnectedness of our world and the importance of being informed and empathetic. Let us stand in solidarity with those suffering near and far and support each other as a solid and compassionate community. By doing so, we can ensure that Santee remains a beacon of hope and resilience even the face of global challenges. So in conclusion, I'd like to remind that you, you that the City of Santee Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee worked tirelessly to create a statement regarding our city's core values. The document can be found on the city's website, and I encourage you to go there and take a look at it. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to, to say that. I just thought it was important. So let's get on with the meeting. Okay, um, going to the consent calendar, any items to be added, deleted, or reordered? Vice Mayor? No. Councilmember Trotter? No, sir. Councilmember McNellis? None for me, sir. City Manager? No, sir. City Attorney? No, sir. Any speaker slips? Yes, sir. We have speaker slips on items one, two, and three. <laughs> Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the... Oh, that is the entire consent calendar. <laughs> I'm not used to being that short. Yeah. Okay, let's hear item number one, please, which is the approval of reading and by title only and waiver of reading in full of ordinances and resolutions on the agenda. Truth. This is truth, and I'm not dizzy today, so hopefully things will go better this time. I don't believe we need any more time for discussion today because I believe this is going to be a shorter meeting than usual. I got a crystal ball. So I remain against passing ordinances and resolutions by title alone because we can afford a little bit of a time delay tonight. And I have another example, a lived experience of why passing items by only reading the title is not good. And that is yesterday's County Board of Supervisors item 14 entitled, Humanitarian Emergency Response and Relief, Supportive Services for Asylum-Seeking Migrants. By title, it sounded lawful and ethical, but past that title, the contents gave $3 million of San Diego's money for people who aren't even American to receive tech toys, food, snacks, water, transit, county public cars, and public property, which could mean our parks and playgrounds. A million dollars a month to support the floodgates open for any and all, unchecked, unverified, unprocessed, undocumented, unvetted, and unlawful. 
So that was a very prime example of why people need to hear at least a summary of an item before it passes. Because title alone creates doubt and leaves room for ill intent of deception, corruption, and illegality. And I was going to urge Ron, he's not here. I was going to say he's the most malleable. I could probably get him to change sides. So I'm just going to use John. I think you're the second most malleable, maybe. And let's see. And because Laura did not read the titles of the items last time, I'm going to use that as my excuse to remain in opposition to this item. Concludes my comments. Thank you. Anything? Anyone else? Motion to approve. I have a motion to approve. Second. I have a second. Please vote. Motion carries unanimously. Councilmember Hall, absent. Thank you. That takes us to item number two, approval of payment of demands as presented. Truth. All right, $52 for council meeting supplies, and I'm hoping it was all spent on organic snacks this time. And that includes you, Laura. You need to make sure you're eating right because I care about your health. There was about $50 for a fitness program subscription and $419 on fitness equipment. So, you know, maybe they're getting there. There was $1,683 in lodging for the League of CA Cities Conference. The airfare was $585. And over $224 per diem for the Cal Cities Conference. Same thing, different name. $200 for International City County Management Association membership renewal. And so I looked at this website, and they changed their code of ethics back in June. Tenant one was changed from, we believe professional management is essential to efficient and democratic local government by elected officials. They changed it to, we believe professional management is essential to effective, efficient, equitable, and democratic local government. And, you know, I guess they don't care about if anyone's elected, but they made sure to throw in that equity. Tenant four was changed from, serve the best interests of the people to, serve the best interests of all community members. People have turned into members of a made-up community. And luckily, by promoting equity didn't make the cut, but they did add a new guideline of promote equity. Let's see, tenant nine, and yes, I read these things just before this meeting. It was changed, but it remains elusive among members. Keep the community informed on local government affairs. Encourage and facilitate <clears throat> active engagement and constructive communication between community members and all local government officials. And that actually sounds pretty good, but how come everyone in government fails at that one? Of course, I know what the answer is because it means more work and resistance. Because if you ask anybody anywhere, nobody's happy about anything and they shouldn't be. And so some people go, oh, don't be angry. I'm not angry. But some people might say to other people, why are you so angry? And then they would say, you know, if you're not angry, you're not paying attention. And I would agree with that. Uh, this organization, the IMCA, also mentions on their website, let's see, identifying best practices from the, around the world to facilitate their rapid adoption. They even have an ICMA China Center that is partnered with a government-run university and has a slogan, of better management, better cities. Does anyone believe that communist China needs more management? So I'm not a fan of this organization. Actually, I mean, if you're going to get membership, you go against it. I'm all for that. I like infiltration. Because uh, they're also going with smart cities, counties. So I don't like that. Technocratic tyranny. Definitely against that. Let's see, $10,300 for the multiple species conservation plan to do things like protect mountain lion habitat so they can kill our pets and bite our faces off. That's a very old joke I told of the county a while ago, but I still like it. Thank you. Motion to approve item number two. Second. A motion is second. Please vote. Motion carries unanimously. Councilmember Hall, absent. Thank you. There are four speakers on the next Ooh. item. Thank you. The first speaker is James. Oh, can I read it first? Oh, I'm out. Sorry, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Adoption of a resolution prohibi prohibiting parking of vehicles on the west side of Marical Lane. Do we want to hear a report on that first? Okay. And uh, Carl. Hi. Thank you. I have a, a short report. Um, again, this is a resolution of the city council um, for a uh, a resolution prohibiting parking of vehicles on Maricol Lane, only on the west side. Um, let me give you a little background. At the August 23rd meeting, City Council um, provided direction regarding prohibiting parking on the west side of Maricol Lane to staff. 
Um, under California Vehicle Code, um, staff to prohibit parking, staff is required and a resolution is required by City Council to prohibit parking. That's why we're here tonight with this resolution. Two new developments are in construction and they're significant um, in regard to the discussion with this because both of those projects were approved and adopted to allow parking on both sides of the street. Um, those two projects are the Ming development, which is a 24 unit multifamily project, um, which has garages for every unit, which is 24 um, or 48 spaces, and they have nine visitor on site parking spaces. The other project, and I'll provide a map here to go into a little bit more detail. The second project is Prospect Estates 2, which is 53 unit mixed development with 106 garage and 42 visitor on parts on, on site parking spaces. Um, the Ming subdivision um, just recently got occupancy for five of the six buildings on Monday. Um, all the improvements are not complete. Um, there's some minor street and some other improvements and punch list items to complete. Um, however, he met the conditions for occupancy. Um, the Prospect Estates is currently underneath grading, uh, mass grading at this time. And at the August 23 meeting, which facilitated and began the discussion, staff brought before uh, City Council the final map for approval. And the background on that is there has been concerns from neighboring properties, primarily to the uh, west, and concerns about noise. The mobile home park, they're very close to the road, um, which brings us to tonight with the resolution with recommendations from staff seeking direction from City Council. Um, let me kind of walk you through this map a little bit. Um, again, Mission Gorge Road is here, Prospect Avenue to the south, Maricol Lane um, starts at Mission Gorge all the way to Prospect. Currently, it's a public street in front of the Vista Del Rio condominium projects. There's 64 condo units on there, and parking is currently allowed on both sides of the street in this location from Mission Gorge Road to Ar Arminda Cor or Circle. Um, there's a private residence. And then highlighted in yellow is the, the Ming subdivision. This was approved in 2007. It's a 24 multifamily units, as I mentioned, 24 garage parking spaces, um, nine visitor parking spaces. And there are, with the approved plan, approximately 22 parking spaces available on Maricol Lane once the project improvements are accepted by city council, which will happen at a later date after occupancy. So Carl, when you say 22. Sorry, I meant there's sizes. 24 garages and there's two parking spaces in each garage. There is no on-site parking other than visitors parking. The 22 Marical Lane spaces I'm referring to, is that the east That's and That's both west sides. Side That's total so available. That was 11, roughly? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Those were approved with the original approval in 2007. Um, with the proposal, um, we're talking about what's shown here in red, no parking in front of the Meng subdivision and Prospect Estates 2. Just the potential loss of potential parking is estimated at 13 parking spaces in front of the Meng subdivision out of the 22 on Maricol Lane. Uh, Prospect Estates, like I mentioned, is currently underneath grading. Um, the street improvements haven't even really begun. This was approved in 2019 with 15 single family units, 38 multifamily units. Um, that equates to 106 garage spaces because every single one of all of these units has a two-car garage. And I'd also point out that the multi or the single family also has driveways that are long enough to accommodate two additional spaces, which aren't really included in these numbers. Um, and within the development itself, on site, not including Maricol Lane, there's 42 visitor parking spaces. That includes around the complexes and on the public and private streets. So those could be a combination of visitor and or guests and or residents, but only within the multifamily, the conditions of approval for our, uh, the single family, the multifamily, those are guest spaces within that spot. Um, but in general, that's the total amount. The potential loss of parking just on the west side in directly on the frontage of Prospect Estates 2 is approximately 35 parking spaces as indicated again on red. And again, we're only talking about um, no parking on the west side from um, Armalenda down to Prospect once all of these um, improvements are completed. So with that, um, staff and the recommendations are adopt the resolution prohibiting parking of vehicles on the west side of Maricol Lane and authorizing the installation of stop signs providing notice of the prohibition. And 
with that, staff's available for any questions. Stop signs? Or stop signs, sorry, no parking signs. And the only reason why I'm distinguishing that as signs because we don't recommend putting red curb. We always talk about red curbing. It's such a long distance. Red curb requires much more maintenance, much more permanent, requires restriping. For longer distances like this, we recommend uh, no parking signs, not red curbs. Speaker's lips. The first, the first speaker is James Ming. Good evening. Respect the council of uh, members. This reminds me of my Navy days, reporting to Secretary of Navy and Chief of Naval Operations. I gotta tell you, our operation room was not as grand as yours. Anyhow, this evening, I would like to present three reasons why I object this uh, adoption. Number one is the primary driver for this is reduce the noise for the mobile home residents. After this issue, concern were raised, and both the TB Home and myself, we have uh, erected the white vinyl fence all the way down, and it is a solid, opaque, tall enough fence. Alongside with the chain link fence, it should have some mitigation effect to reduce the noise. Rather than making the adoption at the present point, we need to have a uh, confirmation that the existing fencing is having a benefit before we jump to the conclusion. Second point is it is a very uh, singularly large and favorable against the, my property because it doesn't go extend all the way to the Mission Gorge Road. The same reason that the Vista DRL cannot accommodate the more parking space inside their perimeter applies to me as well. Thirdly, if this proposal is adopted, this additional 13 vehicles will be rushed into my property and along with all other vehicles, in case of a fire emergency, this could become a problem for the fire engine to maneuver. And I would urge that the city um, look into this aspect. It is a safety issue. I rest my case. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Linda Markow. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council, Staff. My name is Linda Markell, and I'm uh, very pleased with this resolution on Markell Lane. Uh, these people that live in the mobile homes, their bedrooms are all butted up against that fence. And a vinyl fence isn't going to take gas fumes and vibrations of people running their cars uh, late at night pulling in. And it does, you know, it, it does affect the quality of life for my neighbors. I was uh, born and raised, and I grew up with a lot of the fence people at that park. Laura was gracious enough to attend a meeting, you know, to hear the concerns that they have uh, and, you know, their quality of life. And so I'm very pleased that we came to the conclusion of leaving the parking alone in front of the condominiums because they've been parking there 30 years. And it's hard going in and out of that um, lane because it is a lane, you know, cut in the 1800s. And so it does make it difficult when there's people parked on both sides of that street to have two cars pass if they're good size. And, you know, through the years we've, we've know that and we're, we're concerned with it, but you know, those people have been parking for 30 years. Now, in front of Ming's property, no one's ever parked there. No one's ever parked in front of mine. So they're not losing anything. They actually will gain some uh, parking spaces because they will be parking on the east side of Markell Lane, which is directly in front of my house. So that is more parking, and they're not losing something they never had. So I'm very pleased with... Uh, 
this uh, being put down because I think that it's really going to help the people in the mobile home park and, uh, and to the condominiums. Uh, you know, we have safety concerns, and that easement is not wide enough. And back in the day, those mobile home parks are the ones that pulled together to get this place made a city, or we would be still sitting country pumpkins. Because the first time those founders tried to hit to incorporate, didn't work. They saw that they needed those mobile home parks, and they were crucial in the development of this city. And I'm glad that our council and our staff are thinking about that, about them and their quality of life, because they deserve it too. And just think if your bedroom butted up against a little chain link fence with a little vinyl fence, how you would feel with uh, rumbling of cars, gas fumes, even fights where people have gotten in arguments in the cars. So, I mean, we've went through enough and thank you. The next speaker is John Hosick. Good evening. My name is uh, John Hosick. I'm the president of the Santee Mobile Home Owners Action Committee, or SMOAC. So, sorry. The 23rd of September, I had a meeting with that mobile home park. And thank you, Laura, for attending and, and listening to some of their concerns. And in fact, there were some other things that were resolved, but I'm not going to talk about that. Also, just by going out there and looking at the way that the street is structured, there isn't any real room that really abates the noise or the pollution from those houses. Literally, you can see the distance. If you look at the other parks, for example, you're going to have a distance, a much greater distance between a parked car and a, a, a window for a bedroom. Now, we all know that the same thing like Hawaiian Village where someone can idle their car leave their car running, and guess what happens to the poor person, the senior that's living in that bedroom? What, is it, what are they going to do? Now, to his point, one, it's a senior park that you're dealing with. It's not a family park. Okay, so it's not, there's other health concerns when you talk about safety. Two, it's actually safer because you only have cars parked on one side of the street. Thirdly, the walls for the mobile homes are very thin. They're not the typical homes walls thickness that you would normally have. So there's other reasons to, of concern. Fourth, when you open up that street and you're allowing the parking to be parked on the east side, you're actually gaining spaces that were never there. So in addition to the developments that are already supposed to have two-car parking and accommodate their residents. I don't see why this cannot be redlined or be blocked. I see every reason for the safety when you say safety of the residents in that mobile home park. And that is why um, I'm in favor of them, or at least for the city, maintaining that east side where there's no parking. So please, um, I appreciate your listening, and I, I, I appreciate this ordinance if it goes into effect. Thank you. The final speaker is Truth. You know, I never heard anyone say they want people to park in front of their house. That is a first. Uh, as you guys know, I am in full support of more signs, all kinds, everywhere. And, well, maybe this one I'm a little mixed about. I don't like when you say you can't do something. Because then you have to enforce it. And so have you guys considered, oh, that's going to raise the price of an, the enforcement bill, to put it in a simple way. Oh, let's see. I also see issues in moving, removing the ability to park. There's going to be less parking. I mean, contrary to what some, some people have suggested, if you're saying no parking, there will be less parking. You can say, well, there's still plenty, but don't. Don't try to say something that's not true. Let's be real. And I like that the signs are cheaper than a red curb. That's pretty good. Uh, so what are the solutions then? If some parking is going to be removed, what are the solutions? Is there going to be a new lot somewhere? You're just relying on the garages. What do you do for the guests then? 
Uh, but I'm going to say I do under, I 100% understand about mobile homes and them having the thin walls. That is so true. Because I heard the story one time, and it's 100% true. A big truck can drive by a mobile home, and you can mistake it for an earthquake. Um, so my recommendation is building a wall. I do like walls. Uh, rather, that's the community coming together and paying for it themselves, or it's a developer, landlord, or the city. I don't know, but that's something that should be considered. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Push the button. I didn't. But... Okay. You want to speak? Sure. Sure. All right. Well, um, I did attend, uh, as Mr. Hasek uh, stated, um, a meeting with the mobile home park on September 23rd to talk more about their concerns. But um, in actuality, um, the citizens there have been bringing up concerns, different concerns, probably for the last year and a half. Um, as both developments have moved forward. And, um, you know, they, they wanted a wall, but there's some logistical reasons why they couldn't have the wall. And uh, that's because the utilities are above ground there. It's a very, very old mobile home park. And uh, typically, you know, I, I don't think, was, was anybody on council in 2007? I don't. I don't. Yes. Oh. Okay, never mind. Um, well, I wasn't. Um, <laughs> and um, I, I think that um, uh, typically we, we require um, developers to move utilities underground as part, you know, as part of the development. If, uh, but the exception was made for both of these properties. And, um, you know, there's a lot, I mean, there's just a lot of information surrounding that particular issue, so I understand why the developer couldn't build the wall, uh, and I do appreciate that they put up a fence, but the bottom line is the, they're mobile homes. They, they don't have soundproofing like a home. They don't have typical easements like we would require in a development in the city of Santee. They're right up against the, the fence line there. They've got bedroom windows right up against it. Um, because we can't underground those utilities on the west side of Maricel Lane, or the developer couldn't do it, and the mobile home park at this point can't do it uh, due to cost, um, there's not uh, a proper sidewalk on that side as well for parking, and that cannot be built there. Um, so th there's a lot of reasons why, um, you know, the, the, the parking on the street on the west side, I, I feel, is um, the best compromise that we could make with the, with the people that have lived there for decades <laughs> and the new people about to move in that will have two car garages and uh, on-site parking. Um, I did, like I, like I said, I, I went there and I, and I talked to him, and thank you, Carl, for giving me a detailed list of every property and, you know, when it was, um, you know, developed and approved and all, all the steps. And, and I talked to the citizens about it, where they're, the, the condos at the very end uh, on the corner of Mission Corridor and Maricel Lane, they realized that those condos were conditioned and, and built and occupied in 1986. So they didn't want to paint the red curb all the way down to the end of the street. They were okay with that. They understood it. But we're talking about places where nobody's moved in yet. Um, they're going to get. They're going to understand their reality of parking when they move in, and they have plenty of parking on site. Um, they they meet. It, it's not up to us to condition parking on a public street for a development. Uh, the development has to have enough parking on site for it to move forward. So, and and they did back in two thousand and seven. Um, so, you know, I, I support what staff has put forward. And um, I will make a motion to approve staff second. recommendation. Thank you. Was that a second? Yeah. Okay. Do you have any comments? Uh, either of you? Okay. I just have a, a couple questions. Um, one is that uh, is, is there a study that can be done to determine the sound levels before and after that vinyl wall went in? And has it been done? We, we don't typically require after installation. They were approved with sound mitigation and studies at the time of approval. Uh, but what was the sound mitigation prior it, to? It, it wasn't triggered and required. Um, fencing was 
technically not on the plans for Mr. Ming's property. It was not on the plans for the Rio de Vista. The latest development was required to put the fence and what I think Mr. Ming was alluding to, he kind of at his own free will, even though it wasn't required on the plans, he did it as a good neighbor trying to help the situation. Okay. Uh, since there's no studies have been done, then that can be, um, we can't compel him to do it now, as my guess. Um, do we have a best guess, guess as an engineer? Is there a sound reduction, and would there be a fume reduction by putting up that um, vinyl fence? There, the, there might be some minor reduction, um, you know, without doing a full noise analysis because it relates to height and size and distance. That's why you do a noise analysis and, and you do a CEQA document. Um, in my opinion, strictly, yes, there will be some benefit from having a solid vinyl fence compared to a chain link fence, by all means, yes. Well, then I will say in my opinion that it's not going to be enough of a benefit uh, that because of how close the mobile home parks are. And, it, you know, working at a campground, it, a mobile home park is very similar to an RV in, in the insulation. So a, a vinyl fence just doesn't do, do enough to mitigate noise. And then, you know, I really think about when, when would people typically be using that overflow parking is probably going to be when nothing's left, so it's at night, <laughs> and sound travels at night, so the maybe the n possible noise benefit during the daytime, the mit mitigation benefit definitely won't be there at night, um, and that's when they'll be sleeping. So, you know, that's my two cents. Thanks. Um, the other question I have is when I'm looking at the number of parking on that west side that we're looking at. 13 and 35. I, I did a little research while we were talking about this, and I was curious to what the average parallel parking length was. And it, this thing told me between 22 and 26 feet. Around 20 feet is what we use on average for parallel parking. So, and that's how we calc it. That's why it's kind of an estimate, because obviously you have a... 20 foot long truck you're not going to fit in 20 feet so it's an average right. between a prius and a large truck on average it's 20 so that's what we use through traffic engineering to determine parallel parking spots so so essentially even if you use 20 feet as an average there should be at least 700 there's 700 feet between uh where we're proposing from end to end because there's no way you're getting, and that's just for the 35, and if I add the 13 to it times 20, I, I, that doesn't seem like it's that long there to get all those cars in there. I, I just don't see it unless I... Um, you know, I could, uh, Minji May, he actually did an estimate for me. I don't know, Minji, you want to elaborate on that? Come on up. Thank you, Minji. That calculation is based on 20 feet per vehicle. So that 35, that section is about 700 feet long. I think. So it's 700 feet? Yeah. And, boy, that sure doesn't look like it. Okay. Well, I'll say I walked, <laughs> I walked Miracle Lane that morning that I was there. So from Mission Gorge, where the parking already exists, from Mission Gorge up to uh, the private residence, you could fit. 14 cars there mm -hmm. in that in that area. Um, I, I, I noted and I did share with staff a couple of the vehicles were oversized and probably weren't residents, commercial vehicles. So that was just an FYI. Okay. Well, I, I th the reason why I was asking that question is because I'm trying to I was trying to determine whether or not um, we would be losing 35 and 13 parking spaces. Because if that's, I mean, if it's not that long, then, you know, it doesn't, I mean, it's certainly not going out there with a tape measure. I'll have to take your word for it, and I do believe you. And uh, so that's how you came up with that. Um, I don't know. I, I just, 
I, I have trouble with this, and the only reason why is because when we get um, requests to do red curbs, there's usually a full study done, and it does take into account, you know, like sound walls and different things like that. And we're not actually doing that in this case. And so, um, but I certainly, you know, understand what you're saying and, and what the um, tenants there are saying. So um, I, I'm, I'm just not there on this one. So, all right, then, any other comments? Yeah, to uh, Vice Mayor Koval's, uh points, I mean, I don't have to be a sound engineer to know that parking three feet away from someone's window on the other side of a vinyl fence is going to cause sound. I mean, if you've never been on the other side of a vinyl fence before with a neighbor, you can hear them talking very clearly. Vinyl fences are all over town now. That's, they, they're beautiful. They look great, but they, I would suggest they may have even less sound control than a solid wood fence does. So they look way better, but they're, they're hollow. It's, it's, they're hollow slats of vinyl. So they are not, they're not solid material. They, they will not stop noxious fumes from coming over. They won't stop the sound. It's not a block wall. It's, this is a vinyl wall. And the, these properties are on the fence line. It's not, there's no six or 10 or 15 foot setbacks that will also help mitigate. And you can plant shrubbery there that will also help mitigate. There's, there's no possibility of doing that in this, on this section that we would normally look to in other areas of town to help mitigate sound. That's not a possibility here. This is, this is just a kind of a no brainer to me. I mean, I, I know how, I know how loud it is in a next door neighbor's house when they're just out there recreating in their backyard. I can imagine some car like my diesel parked on that wall. Um, you know, not any fault of my own. It was, if it's available parking there, that's, you know, where we have to park if it, my vehicle wouldn't fit inside of a garage. So I certainly, I would understand a resident in the senior facility there getting very angry with my truck being parked out there. And yes, in the mornings I'd have to let it run. Otherwise it's not going to go very far unless it warms up in the mornings and it's loud and it, it would be, yeah, I, I'd feel horrible, but I'd have to do it if that's what I had to do here. Now, th that being said, I wouldn't have that vehicle if I lived in one of these developments because I would know that it's not going to fit. So I'd either sell that vehicle or not buy in this development. Know it going into it. It's a little different for the people to take away from the people over at Vista Del Rio when they've already been there. This has already been... That's, that's a taking away. This, to me, is not a taking away because it's, it hasn't been there previously. It's better planning. So, once again, for that, I speak in favor of the, of the, uh, of the motion. Oh, thank you. No? I'm ready to vote, but I'm not okay. keeping my phone to win. So. And win? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I certainly appreciate everybody's comments and opinions, but... I certainly would hope that you appreciate and, and uh, respect my opinions. Please vote. Um, sir, any possibility I can bring up one? No, sir. Oh. Thank you. Motion carries with three aye votes. Mayor Mento voting no. Councilmember Hall excused. Thank you. That takes us to non-agenda public comment. Speaker slips. We have five speakers. Okay, thank you. The first speaker is Jennifer Palmer. Welcome. Um, thank you so much for your continued leadership in our city. I really appreciate it. My name is Jennifer Palmer, and I'm a registered nurse here in this community. But I'm also a cancer survivor, and I'm actually here to talk about um, one of our big problems in our city that's causing cancer, and that's the use of Roundup or um, glyphosate. I made a little information sheet that has been handed out to some of you if you want to take a look at it. Um, Roundup is the most commonly used, used of brand weed killer and herbicide that contains an active ingredient called glyphosate. 
Um, the facts about glyphosate is that in 2015, the International Agency of Research on Cancer stated that glyphosate was a human carcinogen or a cancer-causing agent. The WHO has declared glyphosate a human carcinogen in 2016. In 2019, researchers at USC Berkeley, Mount Cedar sinai School of Medicine, the University of Washington, all linked glyphosate exposure to a 40% increased chance of getting non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is what I had. Um, Bayer is the main manufacturer of Roundup, and they've settled more than 96,000 Roundup cancer cases to date, with um, thousands more on the docket, Mr. Haggerty, on the docket. So um, as um, a cancer survivor, I'm actually here today to let you know that um, in our community right now, they are using Roundup. At, like in my homeowners association, the company that's doing it is called Brighton. They're our, they're our landscaper and... Um, I was very disturbed when I saw Proposition 65 signs outside of my house um, to let us know that they were using Roundup because that's been linked to the cancer that I have. Um, as a responsible adults, I feel like we have a responsibility um, to our children that we need to protect our children. I just finished a year of chemotherapy, multiple surgeries, and um, radiation, and I can't even imagine watching children go through that. As a registered nurse, um, I've been seeing an increase since I've been back at work for the last six months. I've seen an increase in cancer patients, especially non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in our city. So I'm actually doing a research project right now just so that I can kind of track that cancer pocket. So I'm here today to ask you guys to vote or to put it on the agenda for next time to vote that we can ban the use of Roundup to protect the health of our citizens. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is John Hosick. Uh, again, this is uh, John Hosick. Um, I'm really talking kind of a little bit of both as the president of SMOAC and just a resident of Santee. So this last couple of weeks, I've been cleaning out my office. And did I find some doozies? The city of Santee, for those that don't realize it, has went through a lot of trials and tribulations when it comes not only to the rent control and not only to the leadership and, and what has been put forth. So, John, our mayor, I actually found a, a, a document that really makes me admire you a little bit, that you had a meeting where you said, look, be a partner and not an adversary for those that are in your community. And that was really nice. I saw so many other things as well. Obviously, I, um, Laura, I was able to give you something that, that I thought you'd get a kick out of. Um, as, a, as a rule, this community has done very well for our mobile home community. And for the, the vote that just happened, I extremely appreciate the time and consideration and understand um, I just have to look out for the residents, period, when, when, I'm, when I'm looking at an issue like that. And there's no setback. But there's so many things that this city has done for our organization and for the community just by looking at those papers. My head was spinning. In all reality, I just really want to say thank you for your service and the way that you have led this city and the way that it's actually grown the right way. And your leadership is superb. So thank you. The next speaker is Robert German. Hi, Robert German, uh, Citizens Against Gillespie's Expansion, Low Flying Aircraft. I brought a flyer that's from the county of San Diego, and it came from the California Department of Public Health. It involves aviation leaded avgas. And I'm just going to read the flyer because I didn't have enough to pass out. But uh, there is a SKU on here, phone numbers, it's lead, Children's Lead Week next week, and in commemoration, kind of the, the plane crash two years ago in Santee, I'm here. And Truth is here, so I'm following her. It says, lead and aviation gas. What is aviation gas? Avi aviation gas is a fuel commonly used by small piston engine propeller or rotary aircraft and is the last transportation fuel containing lead in the U.S. In the US. 
Leaded gas from these planes causes dangerous lead air pollution. When children inhale lead, they can develop health problems but show few symptoms. Lead dust from these emissions can be found in neighborhoods around airports, settling on soil, and other objects that people may touch. Why is this a concern? Lead is a toxic metal and can be especially harmful to children as their bodies are still rapidly growing. Lead poisoning can lead to lifelong learning behavioral, reproductive, heart, and other health problems. How can I keep my family safe? Wet wipe services when cleaning, remove shoes before entering homes, wash your child's hands often, cover exposed soil, and the most important, ask your child's doctor about a blood lead test. They're very simple, especially if you live near an airport like Gillespie Field. The perimeter is a mile and a half, an airport that uses these aircraft. I will like to tell you also that when, and you guys are mechanically inclined, most of you guys, they are running full rich when they're doing pattern work. When they're doing touch and goes, they use leaded fuel to cool the air-cooled engines. So besides just getting lead when they travel, Santee and El Cajon, and now they've moved out to Lakeside, really getting hammered with lead. Gillespie is 13th in the nation for the use of leaded fuel. Montgomery is 11th. So we have two airports that use leaded fuel and they're so close together and we live in a valley. So it should be a concern. So I'm just passing this on. Thank you. The next speaker is Truth. You've got you to be careful, German, because it's been said that I'm actually a tough act to follow. All right, but first I'm going to say something serious, and that is the Middle East affects us here all right because we're going to end up giving who knows how many more trillions to Israel. Now, back to non-serious for now. John, these people were all over the place without you. That being said, I'm actually okay if you want to retire and let Laura take over permanently. The joke is interim mayor. Now I have an idea, a touchscreen monitor on the wall that displays the meeting agenda so that people who don't have a phone or don't want to use their phone can look at the full agenda packet using a touchscreen right in, in this building, uh, like a map kiosk at the mall. And I thought that was completely my idea until I went to San Diego City Council recently, and they had one inside the building, but it was visible from outside. But I'm talking about one inside. That would be good. Uh, and I actually talked to the guy that was programming it with his phone, which was interesting. And I'm not saying the city has a budget for it, but yes, they do. It'd be very helpful for people to know, and that, you know, might increase their chance of making an informed comment. Now I'm going to talk about Sandag. Rob, I forgot to say how you did there at Sandag. Oh, well, I'm actually more of a Laura fan, even though she's not a fan of the main board. But you did an excellent job, I meant to tell you, for filling in for John the other month. You were there for two extra fun popcorn-worthy meetings with several hidden backstories, but that's part of why Sandag's so fun. And this is for all the people who don't even know what the heck Sandag is, which is 99% of people. The per mile road use surcharge tax that many reps wanted to implement was finally removed, but it's all political theater and deception. There are many more taxes planned, including priced parking, EV taxes, congestion taxes, and toll lanes. And I'm going to say this, Jack Fisher thought he came up with EV taxes. Wrong. No, he didn't. And let's see, what they call managed lanes will be also what they call dynamic, as in they'll be controlled and who is able to access them when with what. For example, closing a highway lane to cars and only allowing buses to use a lane, or even bikes only. I mean, there was an interview where Hassani Krata, the disgraced CEO, soon to be former, looking forward to it, he said they closed the highway in L.A. to just be walking on it. <laughs> These people are nuts. There's also going to be a tracking of everyone's driving movements and what they call an operating system. From their website, quote, of the five big moves, the next operating system is a digital platform that collects information from vehicles, delivery trucks, e-bikes, and scooters into a centralized data hub. Travel lanes on complete corridors can be dedicated to different uses at different times of day, end quote. So credit to Mary D for this idea. I think the city of Santee and all cities should pass a resolution against any road tax of any kind at any level, local, state, regional, or federal. 
The county just did this yesterday, but they did not include the federal level. And I think you guys should. The final speaker is Michael Brando. Michael, I do want to say that you are very fortunate to have this young lady, Truth, here with you. Our paths intersected at the County Board of Supervisors, which I started attending two and a half years regarding the fake medical emergency. That may be some shocking news to you, but that's exactly what it was. But the good news is that I actually got to start looking at what happens at the County Board of Supervisors. And it's been a great learning experience. That's good news. It also led me to other organizations like the City of San Diego, City Council meetings, and finding out what goes on there. And then finally, I was able to make it to Sandag and start attending meetings there where I've seen these two people, and I saw you there that one day. I say all this because in my experience, in my lived experience, when I've gone around the county talking with people, most people have no idea what a county board of supervisors is. No idea. Most of you probably already know this, but it's easy to fall into the idea that I'm living in my own little bubble. And I'm not saying this is true for any of you here, but it, it could be the feeling of I live in my little Santee bubble and nothing out there is going to affect me. I guarantee you it will because there is an agenda afoot. And this is not a conspiracy. There is a communist, fascist, technocratic, digital form of totalitarianism that is afoot. And some of it is based on the fake climate science. And you too should know about that regarding Sandag. I want to recommend to you a wonderful book. It's called The Psychology of Totalitarianism. Matthias Desmet, The Psychology of Totalitarianism. It's a wonderful book. If you don't actually like to sit and read, there's a great narration of this on audible.com. He breaks this book down into three sections. One is about fake scientific materialism. Two is about how totalitarianism regimes come about. And three is very positive because he goes into some solutions. I mean, this is not the only way to look at what's going on, but if you want to have a better feel what, of what may be creeping toward you, from the West, from the city of San Diego, and from the County Board of Supervisors, check out this book. Even Mayor Bill Wells says this is the best book he's read in 20 years. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. No further speakers, sir. Thank you. That takes us to uh, new business, item number four, update on the ongoing efforts of the Homeless Working Group City Manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Um, in looking back through some of the details, I realized that we did a homeless update to the city last October to the council. So we'll plan this as an annual update on what's going on with homeless services here in the city of Santee for the council and the community. Some of the issues that we've been dealing with, and, and I think they're not, um, they're not a strange issue for most of the folks here in this room and or watching on TV Homeless services is an international reality for us. Uh, we've not had to deal with it for a very long time, but it is hitting the city of Santee, and we are taking action to try to do what we can to keep our community in a positive situation, as well as to assist those that are homeless to have a better life for themselves as well. Uh, we are going to be work I'm going to be talking about the legal framework that the city has to work in, so citizens are aware of that. Some of the recent actions that we've been able to take in the last year some of the costs that this costs for the city of Santee, and also some of the future steps that we're investigating through the work of our homeless working group. Next slide. Some of the legal framework that some of you may be aware of, but just a quick reminder, um, one of the things that assisted in beginning homeless opportunities in the state of California was Proposition 47, 
It was passed by voters, so it was enacted in January of 2019 after being passed in 2019, pardon me, 2018 in November. Uh, it basically says that anything that's under $950, now in California is very difficult to process as a crime, and it's caused a lot of opportunity crime here in the city of Santee as well as throughout the state. Another issue that we've had to deal with in the last several years is COVID-19 as its pandemic issues have expanded to our community and thankfully are no longer here from an emergency health regulation perspective. When COVID-19 hit, the city was mandated to work with the county and we put up um, opportunities for porta potties and for hand washing stations along the San Diego Riverbed and the River Corridor here in Santee. Part of that reason was we couldn't move people that were homeless out of their encampments because there was a fear that they would spread COVID-19 amongst others. So they had an opportunity to stay safe in their encampments. The other issue that I know the mayor and council are very familiar with, and that's Martin versus the city of Boise. Um, it was a ruling by the Ninth District Court of Appeals, a decision that was made in 2019, that effectively says that if there's not a bed available to put a homeless person in, that we're not able to remove that homeless person from public property because it's not illegal to be homeless. And if there's no place that they can be expected to be able to get a bed, we can't remove them. So that is an issue that many in this community are not probably aware of, but that is an issue that across the Western U.S., it's an issue we all have to deal with. And additionally, the city of Santee does enforce our local ordinances wherein we have control. We have a no camping ordinance, we have a no panhandling ordinance on public property, and we do enforce those. So if you see people that are camping on sidewalks throughout the city or in other public parks, uh, we do attempt to enforce those as quickly as possible and make sure that it maintains our public infrastructure for the community. Next slide. Some of the actions uh, that have been taken in the last year, there's a list of them here, and we'll briefly go over those. Uh, various issues related to encampments, cleanups, uh, various grants and funding issues, a river ordinance and draft plans that staff is working on about how to make enforcement and support for the homeless in a more easy fashion to be able to efficiently operate, uh, the interaction levels that we've had with homeless individuals here in our community, and some other pilot programs. Next slide. The San Diego... Uh, Regional Task Force on the Homeless does a point-in-time count annually at the beginning of the year. However, many are not aware that there's a homeless census that's performed by the San Diego River Park Foundation, and since that was just done last year, we thought we would focus on that. It's a very accurate number. Uh, it's conducted annually in September, and it showed that there was 104 persons they found who were homeless in the city of Santee within our San Diego River bed. Riverbed encampments, they found 53 that's an increase from 48 in the month of August. They found 13 individuals who are identified as being homeless and 52 hand-built structures throughout our river bid. That equates to, using the calculation method of 1.75 persons per hand-built structure, a total of 104. Um, the little graphic that's at the bottom of the slide is taken from the San Diego River Park Foundation and you can see where many of those encampments and those hand-built structures were found as they were located in our riverbed. Next slide. Other things that have happened in the last couple of years, uh, San Diego River Park Foundation has been a really great partner for the city of Santee, and uh, we are having a, a discussion with them at our next working group meeting. Uh, they provided some figures for us. In 2022, they did 22 cleanups took in over 70,000 pounds of debris removed from the San Diego River here in Santee. In 2023, bear in mind we're not done with that year yet, but they've already done 20 cleanups and removed 62,000 pounds of debris. Um, their total of smaller and larger cleanups that they've done is over 194,000 pounds of debris removed from the San Diego River since 2020 through the COVID years. Those are debris piles that have been removed from non-occupied encampments. Law enforcement issues that we've been dealing with through April through September, uh, there's been a really great collaboration between our COPS team, our HOPE team, the Alpha Project, who the city has a contract with, and our Public Services Division. In that few months of April to September of this year, 
Several encampments were posted throughout the riverbed, beginning with the ones that were immediately behind the Santee Drive-In, and they proceeded westward as long as we had funding to fund the Alpha Project. Um, those encampments were occupied. Staff worked with law enforcement to post those encampments. It's required that they be posted 72 hours before they are going to be cleaned up. And in that process, we removed 75 thousand pounds of debris from occupied encampments in the San Diego River bed from April to September. Another issue, there's an asterisk there, is that personal belongings of homeless and, uh, residents in the encampments, they have to be able to say, I still want to keep them, even though we're moving them out of the encampment. So the city is obligated to um, bag and tag those personal belongings and keep them for a minimum of 90 days. Right now, that uh, pers those personal belongings are stored at our public services operations yard, and they're tracked so that after 90 days, if no individual comes to pick up their belongings, those can be removed. But we need to keep them for 90 days. In addition, there are other volunteer organizations who assist with cleaning the riverbed. Uh, one of them I think the council and the community is probably pretty familiar with is the World Mission Society Church. Uh, once a year, they come forward, and we recognize them for the support that they've given for homelessness in the riverbed. Next slide. Encampment grant. Uh, this year, it's a $17 million grant that was awarded. The city of Santee, our city council, uh, agreed to partner with other agencies, and we submitted a grant in February of 2023 to the state of California. That grant was awarded to the tune of $17 million in June of 2023. Our partners on this project are the county of San Diego, the city of San Diego, and Caltrans. Funding from this grant will provide interim and permanent housing subsidies for homeless residents in encampments throughout the Sandy River bed, basically from the lakeside area all the way westward through the coast. There's going to be seven staff who will assist in collaborating to perform outreach services, and they will coordinate with other outreach providers to assist in that process. Be, the hope is we'll get about 300 people experiencing homelessness in the San Diego River total Many of those will come from Santee from our 53 encampments that we have. Next slide. I'm going to turn over the next two slides to our city attorney who worked tirelessly to put together the next two pieces of information for you. Thank you, um, <clears throat> Mayor, City Council. Um, one of the actions that uh, we have taken as a city, uh, working in collaboration with the city staff, city council, homeless working group, was the development of the, the river corridor ordinance. Um, as the council is very well aware, um, the, the river is a major asset to the city, but it's also uh, a potential problem, um, particularly with regard to fires in that corridor. And the fire department has done an excellent job of documenting the various fires that have occurred in that area, and there are just too many to, to name uh, that have occurred in, in the last several years. Um, we have been fortunate thus far to avoid a major catastrophe, but we've had fires burn uh, up to the backs of, of homes and present significant challenges. And so it was um, something that uh, collectively uh, the, the team worked on uh, within the structure of the Boise decision, which uh, the city manager mentioned. Um, so, so what the River Court Ordinance does is define a certain area in which certain activities performed by anyone in that area, um, those activities are prohibited. Uh, so that includes uh, causing a fire, um, having an, a fire ignition device, uh, taking other actions that result in uh, pollution or degradation of the quality of that, that corridor. Uh, that uh, went through several um, processes with the sheriff and fire and, and staff to, to develop. Um, with council input, and then we uh, brought that to the council earlier this year, and the council um, approved that. Uh, we then had a an education campaign, and we we updated the council on that process. We provided uh, lots of notice to people in that corridor before beginning active enforcement in May of this year. So we are actively enforcing that ordinance. Um, we have three. Uh, pending criminal actions uh, pursuant to the new ordinance. All of those involved uh, situations where someone uh, was uh, found holding a, an ignition device near a fire. 
And so we will continue to prosecute those. We will, any activity of that sort, we will prosecute. Uh, and, um, you know, again, it's the activity that's the concern. And we're, you know, we're, we're looking forward to um, establishing the track record of the, the ordinance and making it clear to everyone that we will continue to actively enforce this because of the urgency of the problem uh, in the area. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in addition to the sort of criminal aspects of the ordinance, um, there are the other aspects of the ordinance, uh, along with um, some of the issues that the city manager already sp spoke to. And so we have been working closely with uh, CSD primarily, um, but other city staff as well, as, as well as law enforcement, um, to streamline how we approach uh, issues associated with quality of life uh, in the city, um, because of some of the conditions associated with um, both uh, people in the river corridor and outside the river corridor. And so we've um, worked to develop sort of decision trees and matrices to allow staff to kind of quickly make decisions. So they, every, every event isn't, you know, a, a let's, what do we do? You know, it's just sort of built in as a process. Um, now, obviously, you have a limited staff and you have a lot of, property to deal with. And, and so one of the things we, we have done, which we think is important, um, is worked with staff um, to prioritize um, city-owned property because th that's areas where we can get in quickly, we can use our authorities quickly, we don't have to coordinate with other public agencies or private parties. Um, and, you know, we think it's appropriate for our tax dollars to be sent, spent on, on those areas um, and, but, but obviously there's also a lot of private property where these conditions exist. So we have procedures in place to deal with, um, trying to educate the property owners about what they can do to try to address a condition, but always be a backstop to, um, in, in the event it's necessary and there's a health and safety concern, um, address those conditions. Similarly, uh, there's a lot of other public agencies that own land within the city, including within the river corridor. So we've worked hard to develop protocols where we notify those public agencies. We try to work to have collaborative arrangements where they promptly address conditions on their property. Uh, but if not, we're, we're always you know, there to continue to facilitate trying to, to resolve issues. Um, but there's necessarily a, some amount of prioritization uh, that goes on because you have a limited staff and it can't be everywhere at, at all at once. Um, and so uh, we will continue to, to work on, on those issues with the city manager and with city staff um, and continue to try to aggressively enforce the, your, the laws that are on the books to try to improve the health and safety of your community. Uh, one final comment before we go to the next slide. Uh, in the desire to want to make sure that we can be responsive in the river corridor because there are so many fires uh, city attorney mentioned that uh, there's a number that have been easily and frequently documented by our fire department and the River Park Foundation, uh, over 200 uh, in a year. That's that's a lot of fires in a riverbed, and it's very dangerous. So we're not here specifically saying we're going, quote, after homeless. We're going after the risk that that causes to our community, including people living in the riverbed and the property owners surrounding that riverbed. Uh, one of the things with the health and safety issues is working with the county council's aware community members may not be but the county of san diego loans a lot of property that is actually in the san diego river bed within the city limits of the city of santee we did have some concerns from a homeless encampment that was immediately behind some of the brand new housing that was going in uh, on the town center area and we found out staff looked to post it as was required by our ordinance and our processes and found out ah, we don't own that. We can't post it. We can't enforce on that site. So we did work directly with the county. Uh, they went out. They did their own posting. They did took a little bit longer than we would normally have done, but they provided a lot of resources and services to those individuals in that encampment, and they were able to move them out, and they cleared up that encampment. So we intend to work very strongly with the county on those processes through our homeless working group and through other avenues as much as possible on the county-owned parcels in the San Diego River and elsewhere in the city. Uh, next slide. Speaking of interactions with homeless individuals, 
Uh, the Sheriff Department does still have the HOPE team, and we mentioned earlier some of the uh, really great work that was done by that team uh, in cooperation with the rest of our city staff and others on some of the encampments this, this past year. PATH San Diego is a resource provider that the city contracts, and they participate in our homeless working group. They come in and they make uh, opportunity to talk about issues that they see that's going on in the river, who they've interacted with. We find out, oh, gee, ECTLC talked to the same person. Fire department just responded to the same person. Code enforcement just worked with the same person. So it gives us a chance to share those resources and that knowledge, and PATH has been very responsive when we've asked them to assist with problem areas for the city of Santee, like we have a lot of RVs that are parked in our community. Many of them are now homes for people who have no other place to live. Uh, those individuals, it's not a crime to stay in your home, in your RV, except for the fact that if they want to try to connect to water, power, dump their holding tanks and our storm drains, all of that is illegal. So we work very closely with PATH to try to see if we can get them to provide resources to move some of those motorhomes, which may or may not be actually operable by the time they park here in our streets, and also to encourage them to participate in other programs so they can get out of the situation that they're in. Uh, ECTLC is a provider who has temporary housing opportunities for non, uh, from, pardon me, for homeless within the city of Santee. Uh, we do contract with them to provide services, and we will be looking at opportunities to continue that going forward. Next slide. One of the other things that I think the council is aware of, but the community may not be, we had a pilot program that we started this year with combination effort between the city of Santee and the city of El Cajon. Uh, our representative on the MTS board I had a meeting with staff and law enforcement and the city of El Cajon at Santee Trolley Square. It's a privately held shopping center. They have hired their own security because of some of their concerns that they've seen with their retailers within that area. And they wanted to know that the city was going to be behind them and what could be done regarding the trolley. Many people in this community are aware that without any need to pay for a ticket, it's easy for individuals, homeless or not, to hop on a trolley, come into Santee, steal items from our retailers, cause other types of problems, get back on the trolley, and get out of town. It's been an issue for us for a long time. We have convinced MTS to do a pilot program and require a ticket to have a trolley be staffed, require that people have a ticket to get on the trolley, to come to El Cajon and to Santee. If they don't have a ticket, they don't get on the trolley. So those of you that live in Santee and you want to get out of town, I hate to tell you, but you're going to now need to buy a ticket to get on the trolley as well. It goes both ways. But we're very interested. It's already started with MTS. They uh, are going to be giving a report fairly soon, and we're looking forward to that to see how effective that's been and whether or not we have the opportunity to expand that service to a full-time service for the city of Santee because our retailers would really appreciate that. Next slide. Um, the budget that the city has over time, um, we've talked about in the past the hazard mitigation grant. Uh, I know that our fire chief and our fire department is very interested in this. We can't wait. Council is very, very concerned of looking at the risk factors in the river. Um, We'll hear more about the ARPA monies in the next item, but there are monies available in ARPA for local match for a hazard mitigation grant that's in the amount of over $7 million to assist with defensible space in the San Diego River corridor. We've done some defensible space clearing in the past, and just a reminder to council and the community, in this year's budget, there is $78,000 to go towards additional maintenance so the area that we cleared doesn't get overgrown again. So we're covering that cost in the budget this year. The reason that's regarding homelessness is because if it's cleared, very often individuals who are homeless do not want to camp in an area that is cleared um, of a lot of brush. The Alpha Project is a provider of clearance services for the city. Uh, we mentioned them previously, and we want to make sure that council is aware. We would like to come back before the council and ask for an additional amount of money um, we've already used up that $30,000 that's in this budget uh, just since the 1st of July. So we will be asking for additional monies. That's more monies to help with homeless services, and we'll take it out of ARPA if the city council approves that with a future agenda item being brought forward. CDBG CV, council I know is already aware, and those services have extended into this year, and they will be ending unless we find another way to fund them. 
We've talked about PATH. We've talked about ECTLC. We also fund Home Start that helps with rental assistance to keep people out of homelessness. The East County Homeless Task Force, we provide $5,000 a year to be a participant in them, uh, their programs, and they do attend our homeless working groups to give us information on what's going on in the East County region. Crisis House has now begun attending our homeless working group to share the information on what they're doing and look to see if they can fill in any of the gaps in homeless services. Uh, they have a corporate office here in Santee, but they do not provide direct homeless services within our corporate boundaries. Um, and then CSA San Diego is just another entity that we provide funding for to help rental assistance for those who are on the brink of homelessness. To date, that's about $536,000. And again, that does not include staff time to deal with stormwater problems, code enforcement problems, um, all of the other issues with encampment cleanups. So we'll be coming forward to council at a future date, very likely to help assist in funding another limited term position that can work with the new grant that's coming forward, as well as assist with Alpha Project and staff in working with the Sheriff's Department on posting, scheduling cleanups, holding and tracking all of the materials that have to come from those encampments and storing them and then getting rid of them when the time is appropriate. Next slide. Temporary shelters. Um, we've already talked about the impact that Martin versus Boise has had. In April of 2023, the County of San Diego attempted to pursue a homeless shelter near the Edgemore Barn. Uh, they sent out a mailer to Santee residents requesting feedback and stating numbers from the point in time count that was done by the Regional uh, Task Force on the Homeless. And they held a public town hall meeting here in our community on the same night as a city council meeting, so it was difficult for council to attend that. But after feedback that they received at that particular meeting, that project is no longer moving forward. What are some of the alternatives that we have? Uh, if we need to provide housing, we can continue with ECTLC, but the city, I'll remind the community, the city already has an existing MOU with the East County Communities and the County of San Diego to work together to provide a homeless shelter. We don't have the county wanting to move forward on that particular type of, of operation right now. So we'd like to see that move forward. That could provide a benefit for us. And we have also proposed to county staff that there may be the potential of doing a land swap for an area of the community that currently, according to our housing element, would allow for a homeless shelter to be built that is not near an area that is set aside for affordable housing or a part of our arts and entertainment district that we're trying to approve. So all of those are additional options, and the Homeless Working Group, as well as other entities who partner on that, will continue to work on those alternatives and try to bring something forward to council if something becomes active. Next slide, please. We're just about done, folks. Just a quick update. Um, homeless Working Group, again, it was established officially in 2022. It's a staff-level working group. We have a couple of council members who come and sit in on that just to see what's going on. It's not a public meeting. It's for us to talk behind the scenes, share information, look at what resources we've got, how can we make something else happen. It's a brainstorming operation. Um, we do data sharing. We test different ideas. We toss out collaboration of different resources develop public information, um, opportunities that could be there, and we look at future plans to deal with homelessness and stealing them if they're effective from other communities. Next slide. Continuing response on homelessness, we will encourage, highly encourage, anybody who has a commercial property, whether that be retail, whether that be multifamily, whether that be an industrial or manufacturing site, please work with our San Diego County Sheriff's Department here at our Santee station about getting a no press trespass agreement. We get multiple calls from individuals saying, I have homeless people on my property. I have had them on my, on my shopping center. What can I do? It's very difficult for the Sheriff's Department to enforce regulations on private property without a tres no trespass agreement. So we encourage everybody to move forward with that and contact the station. We're still going to continue to work with our resource providers on dealing with the encampment grant, the $17 million grant. We're going to be anticipating risk reduction through the FEMA grant. Note I said anticipating because we're still keeping a positive outlook that we'll get that 17, pardon me, that $7 million. Uh, we're going to monitor the MTS pilot program and see if we can make that full time if it's effective. We're going to continue to monitor the annual homeless census that's done by the San Diego River Park Foundation and the point in time count, which hasn't always been easy for us to track here in Santee. So we're trying to work more closely with that entity. And we're going to search for additional best management practices throughout the region. Next slide. 
Public information. This is something that we get a lot of questions about. Council is very aware of that. I know that they're probably contacted multiple times a week, if not multiple times a day, with people saying, there's a homeless guy here. What do I do? If you are concerned about what to do, the city has looked at, through our homeless working group, what information can we give to citizens and businesses about what to do about homeless issues. There's an FAQ that's being developed that will go on our city website and out to our social media that talks about what to do. If you see somebody homeless in the city of Santee, how can I help them? What should I do to help them? What are the resources that are available? How do I provide assistance if I feel like I wish to do that? Or how do I get enforcement to move them if I feel like I need that? I would strongly encourage, I had a long conversation with a citizen just this morning who said, gosh, we have all these homeless issues and we put it on Facebook and I send it out on Santee Patch and other social networks and I never know what happens. So the reason you never know what happens is because there's no government agency that really monitors those social media sites. We don't get that information. If you have a problem, please contact the sheriff's non-emergency department line. It's listed on this screen. Give them a call. Let them know, I see somebody who's homeless. I don't know what to do about it. They're, I'm having a problem. They look like they're wandering in the middle of the street. Um, they don't seem to be you know, recognizing the rules of society, let me put it that way. Um, that's a call to the non-emergency line. If you feel that you are in a situation that causes you danger, that causes you concern over your life, limb, or that of another person, whether it's a homeless individual or another, do not hesitate to call 911. The person I met with this morning had a situation where they felt they were very endangered. They were sad that they didn't have somebody respond. I said, did you call 911? Well, no. Please don't hesitate. Citizens do not. If you feel you are in danger, just call 911. Don't hesitate. Also, we have a new app, it's My San TCA app, that's out. It does have an opportunity for a service request. If you have a concern about homelessness in the city and you want to talk about somebody sleeping on a bench or somebody's living in the canyon behind my house or up on the hillside, send in a service request on the My Santee app. Let us know about it. We will do what we can to help resolve that situation. may not always be as easy as possible, but we're going to do whatever we can. Um, and so that is, that is really what we want to do with public outreach and information. Next slide. Completes my presentation. I don't know if there's any questions on the part of council. Let's go to speaker slip first. There's one speaker, Truth. That was a very thorough report. I actually wish that some of that would have been provided on, on the agenda packet, but that's okay. You guys want to see my notes? Look at all that. I was listening. All right, there you go. Uh, all right. Prop 47, stolen goods under 950. All good. No longer a crime. And that's very clear because I've been seeing the theft skyrocket everywhere. You got the stores with the stuff locked up. Luckily, I don't hang around those, those areas too much. Uh, pandemic legal framework. That's what I heard. And I legitimately like that legalese language. Very safe, politically correct, also accurate. That's why I liked it. And I heard, oh, ARPA money. ARPA money for cleanups. You know, that, that I like to call it the American Ruination Plan Act because that's what it's pretty much all the money's gone to. So if it's going for cleanups, that actually sounds like a positive for once. And I heard Marlene say people could stay safe in their encampments. I guess people are staying safe everywhere these days. Martin versus Boise. If there's no beds, people can't be removed from public property. And the shelters, there's never enough beds. That's the problem. That was, that was almost like a rigged result on that case. And let's see, this is a good one. The trolley, no panhandling. Yeah, you're talking about no panhandling, but if you go to any trolley, even Santee, as safe as it is, you will see panhandling. I can tell you two stories here. Uh, there was a guy that I recently, he asked me for some napkins, and I was with an 18-year-old uh, young man that I did not know, helping him find his way. And the young guy said, I don't have any napkins, I'm not a woman. And I said, I got some napkins. It's not because I'm a woman. I just <laughs> like to help people and for myself. Okay, something gets dirty. And there was another guy who asked me for food, and I had just bought some fresh bread. Here you go. Perfect. Um, but MTS, I talked to that board. I hate that board. <laughs> it's the worst board I talked to. 
because they're they they're and it's because there's a lot of ignorance. It's not anything personal against anybody. I like some of those people actually. But that fare being collected, that is not going to solve the problem if the fare is collected just in El Cajon and Santee. And it's not because it's just two places. It's For one, it's inequitable, and I'm going to make that argument. Uh, and two, that's not what the problem is. The problem is they don't have any security. And yes, I know they just hired some. Talk to them about that. It's not real security. They're not even armed. They're not on every car like they should be. That's not going to work. I don't even have much time. Well... Let's see, cleanups for the riverbed. The sidewalks need to be cleaned. They're dirty. People need to stop littering. Let's see, the ordinance signs that people are stealing and they're setting fires. No one's going to listen to those signs. I'm glad the county's actually aiding and cleaning up their mess. And the homeless shelters, that's probably going to go NIMBY, but you need substance abuse treatment. There's no chance of fixing that problem either. No further speakers. Thank you. Um, council members? Rob, did you have any? Dustin? All right, then. Thank you very much for the report. That takes us to item number five, resolution appropriating funds for the potential future construction of a temporary fire station at the Public Services Operations Yard and finding the action is not subject, project subject to the California Environmental Quality Act. Fire Chief. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council. Um, I'm going to do my best not to get too close to the mic because I was told by my son last time I did a presentation, he was watching from home, and uh, I said as I was too close to the mic, so I'll do my best this time. This item is in regards to a temporary fire station and the request for funding authorization. Uh, more formally, a resolution of the City Council appropriating funds for the potential future construction of a temporary fire station at the Public Services Operation Yard. If you recall, on March 22, 2023, AP Triton LLC presented our community risk assessment and long-range master plan, long-range master plan, and they had a list of 27 recommendations. In addition to the recommendations, they just gave a comprehensive report of some of the items that we needed to address that they perceived as vulnerabilities in the city of Santee. During that presentation, they showed this slide, which was our four-minute response times from our two fire stations that exist. And they highlighted two areas of the city where we had vulnerabilities because our response times were not within this four-minute standard, the south and the north. And following that presentation, I give a presentation to this group uh, where we discuss the potential of how we could mitigate those vulnerabilities through constructing two fire stations. And we identified the most likely locations, not the best. I'll reiterate that because we, we looked at a lot of different variables and said, based upon what we had available to us, city-owned property, these were our best, most realistic locations where we could put a fire station and really dramatically impact positively impact our response times. One was the operations yard, the other was up here at City Hall. The operations yard and why we started to really focus on that as the primary location for constructing a new fire station had to do with our call volume and the density of our calls. And this is somewhat of a zoomed in picture of where our calls are. The bright yellow spots represent the higher density calls and as they get to more red calls, or more red areas, I should say, those represents where calls, we do have calls there, but not quite as frequently. And it makes sense if you look at the construction along the Mission Gorge Corridor we have, and adjacent to it, we have a brand new giant Las Colinas jail. We have Lantern Crest that's over to the eastern portion of our city, the new Sharp Reese Steely facility, uh, the town center or Trolley Square, I should say, and then Sky Ranch. I highlight these because all of these were constructed post-2000, which we talked about um, last time that we had any changes as far as staffing in our, in our fire department. As mentioned by City Manager Best, this map shows the geographic locations of our river bottom fires that we've been tracking since 2021. 
And this map demonstrates the four minute response time if we were to put a fire station at the operations yard. And this next one, a little bit busy, if you kind of look, look closely, you can see it's an overlay of all three, which is the four minute response time from the op yard, plus where our call density is, plus where those river bottom fires. And I show this just to really highlight the benefits of having a fire station at that location. And we talked about during my presentation on April 26, the order of operations to get where we wanted to get, get where we wanted to be, which is four fire stations and the order of operations to get there. And I'm happy to say, which you're aware of, um, we're already underway with the third fire station in shop design. And our hopes is to award the design contract on November 8th. So we're making progress. The third fire station, which will be known as Station 20, will be located at the op shard along with the shop. And this slide demonstrates where that would be. There's a large, somewhat spoils pile that's off to the side that fortunately our um, building department and engineering department had predetermined as a site for future construction. So there's a lot of pros of utilizing this site for a fire station because what it already has to offer as far as infrastructure on site. What we're proposing is the construction of a temporary fire station to the rear of the op shard, which would be the northeast corner. And why we're, we chose this location is some of the similar reasons that we talked about for constructing a permanent fire station here which we showed in some previous slides, but putting it in this back corner would allow us to maintain operations at the op shard for our public services division, but it also would make sure that it does not impact the construction or future construction of the permanent fire station. What that would look like is a double wide manufactured home, very similar to what you see here, and then a steel framed apparatus bay that would house two units, a medic unit and an engine company. Some benefits of this temporary fire station is that it would accelerate our service ahead of the two and a half to three year timeline between the design and then the construction of a third fire station. We've already talked about how we needed this yesterday. And so we could potentially have a operational fire station within the next six to nine months, which is a huge, huge improvement from a two and a half to three year timeline. We'd improve our response times to the southern portion of Santee. We'd improve our response times along the San Diego River Corridor and Forester Creek Corridor, which we showed is a high fire threat and also a high fire incident locations. Also improve our 10 minute medic response times throughout SLEMSA. And why that is, is we would take a unit medic five from the most western portion of our city and put it smack dab in the middle, which then would allow it to have better response times to the rest of the area that we serve for SLIMSA. This would also help to decrease our unit hour utilization levels for Medic 4, which has been a focal point of actions that we've taken over this last year. We put into service two BLS units between us and Lakeside, and we put them in during peak call volume time, 0800 to 2000 or 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., and we still have barely been able to move the needle on Medic 4's UHU. Cautionary UHU is 30%. Medic 4 at the time of the AP Triton report was the upper 30s, 39%. Our numbers throughout this entire year, Medic 4 has been at 40% plus. And even with the institution of those changes of the two BLS units and some changes to the way that we do our dispatch procedures, we just recently, over a very short period of time, were able to get our Medic 4 UHU to drop to 38%. So by moving Medic 5, we could help to alleviate some of the call discrepancies or disparities between Medic 4 and Medic 5. This would also help to increase the longevity of Fire Station 5, which was identified in the AP Triton report as something somewhat cautionary. That fire station was designed for two units at the most. Right now we have three. It should have three to five people in that station, and it has eight. So if you've ever been to Station 5, you realize there's no additional places for parking, there's no additional places for apparatus, there's no additional places to bed down firefighters at night. And the same could be said for Station 4. 
We're just simply at max capacity. And if we keep going as is with station five, we're going to wear out that station far ahead of its expected useful life. And then another benefit is that these facilities, the temporary station that we're proposing, could be moved. The plan as presented was we would build a third station, we would tear down station four, and we need somewhere for those units to respond out of when we get to station four, and then we want to build a four station up in the northern portion of the city. And the cool thing about these units is that they actually could be relocated, stuck on a trailer, and relocated to the future sites. So we would get more use out of them than just this one Station 20 uh, facility. The estimated cost is approximately a million dollars. The big ticket items are the manufactured home, which we would be buying off the shelf. When I say off the shelf, it means it's, it's a design that's already available, and it would fit our needs, fortunately, but by buying something that's off the shelf per se, it decreased cost and it also decreases the time for it to be able to be delivered on site. The other big ticket item is the apparatus bay. It's a steel structure, but we do have to make it uh, meet our needs, which is mount it, exhaust, recirculating system on it, obviously lighting, electricity, uh, PPE storage and cleaning appliances. And then additionally, um, it would have to have a, Pretty solid foundation for our apparatus because they're pretty heavy and have to have fire sprinklers. So those two items make up the bulk of the cost. And then in addition, there's all the site prep and utilities hookup. The proposed funding. At our meeting on September 30th for SLEMSA, it's the Santee Lakeside Emergency Medical Services Authority, we discussed what we could do with the reserves that we now had. And Councilmember Trotter and Councilmember Koval, or commissioners, I should say, at that meeting, they were commissioners, uh, asked the question about what are we going to do now that we have control over this excess funds? And we've always talked about when we get control, we want to push that back into the community and, and translate to some form of service. But the question also got asked is, hey, can these funds be used justifiably to assist with housing our paramedics that are associated with these units and housing the actual units themselves. And myself and Chief Butts uh, said unequivocally, yes, absolutely. It's something we have not done in the past, and we should have, but that is absolutely something that we should do. It's, it's, it is 100% justifiable. So we're recommending that 500000 be utilized from our portion of our excess EMS funds, and then we're proposing a reallocation of $300,000 from the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program that right now is ARPA funded. And while we're proposing this, it is a couple reasons. Is we do need to identify and um, obligate the ARPA funds sooner versus later. We don't want to lose them. And we do have the ability to do in-kind services for a portion of our grant matching. So that's option B, if we do need, if we do need this $300,000 out of the $900,000 we currently have appropriated. But then the next reason for bringing this up is we believe that we're actually, if successful, are only gonna have a 10% grant match obligation. Fingers crossed. Which means our obligation, our personal obligation for the city of Santee is gonna drop from 900,000 to $360,000. So for those three reasons, we feel very comfortable with the strategy of changing or reallocating $300,000 from our existing hazard mitigation grant funds, moving that over towards the construction of this facility, and then if necessary, we would then use uh, our general fund monies as we get down the road, which would be years from now. If necessary, we would take $300,000 from our general fund to make that 900000 whole if we're successful, and it's 25%. But we're really hopeful it's not going to be 25%. As it stands with FEMA right now, it's a 90-10 match, meaning 10% for us, which is very good news. And the last bucket of money is $200,000 from the Homeless Regional Support, which City Manager Best just spoke extensively about, and... Why we're asked for 200000 is 
kind of similar to what we already talked about with the ARPA funds and need to obligate those funds. Uh, and also, because our existing program needs are being met financially, we wouldn't ask for this if they were not being met. So with all that being said, the recommendations are to authorize the city manager to appropriate 500000 from the EMS fund reserves, reallocate and appropriate $300,000 from ARPA funds set aside for the HMGP matching funds, and reallocate $200,000 from the ARPA homelessness regional support funds into the fiscal year 2024-28 capital improvement program budget, and then in addition, authorize the appropriation of the $300,000 from the general fund if needed to make up, to get to that $900,000 if it comes back as a 25-75% match. And that concludes my report. Any questions? Thank you. Um, we'll go to speaker slips and four questions. There are two speaker slips. The first speaker is Truth. Justin, I appreciate it. All the pictures and the audio sounded good, better than mine. I like popping the mic. All right, now we've got average four-minute response time. Let's see. Blah, blah, blah. Cautionary levels, that's not good. So that's why I was happy to see this item because I actually 100% support it. And that money, man, what a deal. You're going to get buckets of money from ARPA. I never say ARPA. The American Ruination Plan Act. And FEMA, that's unusual too. I never see anything positive coming from FEMA. They're pretty horrible response too. But if you can get a 90-10 deal, man, that's not even gambling. That's just a win. Uh, and just if you're going to have those manufactured buildings, you got to make sure you paint them red. Don't leave them white like that picture. That's my request. Uh, two and a half to three years, 100000 for the furnishings and equipment, million bucks. Actually, that sounds like a good deal to me. Uh, ironically, though, this area around City Hall is the area that will not be served by the temporary fire station. You guys weren't concerned about your own safety? I mean, I don't know. Um... Yeah, what else? I don't need to say rest. I just, in, in general, I'm very supportive, and I thought that the uh, financial viability was very well thought out. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Dustin Gerhardt. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Dustin Gerhardt. I'm the president of the Santee Firefighters Association, and I just want to say that uh, today is a very important day for the city of Santee for the citizens, for the firefighters that uh, have been sworn to protect this community. Um, you know, it's been since 19, in the 1960s since we've added any additional coverage to the city of Santee, any additional coverage for fire and EMS services. So this is a big deal. We are in full support of it. And there's two, two people that I really want to address and recognize, and that's Dustin Trotter and Vice Mayor Koval. Thank you. Thank you for everything that you've done. Um, you know, Chief showed that, that the report on there. Um, we saw a coverage gap on the north. We saw a coverage gap on the south. And, Laura, this is your district, and I know that you wanted to take care of this. And, Dustin, I know that you've been putting a lot of effort into getting this ready to go. And I know council has as well. City staff, Heather, Chief, Carl, Sam, a lot of people putting a lot of work into this. Public safety. So... We appreciate that. And I know that we still have some work to do, just like the chief showed on that map. We still have a coverage gap on that north end of the city. We still have eight-minute response times. I know that we'll get there. I know that we'll address it. We will. This is the first step of several to get this done. And we thank you for your support. And uh, thank you. Appreciate it. No further speakers. You're welcome. Thanks. Uh, you know, before we get, make any comments, uh, Council, I just was wondering, since this is a manufactured mobile home that's going in there, are we going to be able to be a member of SMOAC? I would love to be a member of that community, or that committee, I should say. Great. All right. Um, anything, um, Councilmember McNellis? Motion to approve staff recommendation. <clears throat> Thank you. Council Member Trotter, anything? Tossing to me. All right. Well, then I'll then I'll second. Vice Mayor. I'll second the motion. Um, I do want to. Can we pull up the slide of the, you know, where it would be located? And I know this is for future planning, but I want to just say it now. 
Um, this is my district. <laughs> so I'm very familiar with the people that live in the, the apartments over here. Um, and they communicate, a few communicate with me regularly. So I just want to point out that one apartment complex that really juts out towards the property. We'll need to be mindful in design that we're not disturbing them. Um, the, the other note that I made about this is um, moving the spoils. And, uh, you know, I do appreciate that the prior uh, item talked about where we store the spoils, which is also in my district. <laughs> so, um, you know, 90 days of, of spoils from the river bottom that ultimately, I don't know if anything's ever been collected from a resident. Well, okay, maybe. Um, rarely, I'll say. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's a smell for the neighbors. It's a concern for the neighbors. Sometimes it's even a site issue because it, it mound, the mound can get so high. So um, I, I, I want to make sure when we're relocating that and also condensing that area for the spoils that we look at other properties that are not so close to residences that maybe the city owns or has control of to move spoils in the future. Spoils are not going away from the river bottom, as, as, we, can, as we all heard. Um, and then, you know, the final comment is, uh, isn't it great that we have local control now with SLEMSA? It's just kind of the best thing that's ever happened because this wouldn't happen. $500,000, you know, we don't have that in our general fund to, to fund this. And this is truly the result of, of SLEM, SLEMSA coming into fruition, and it was a lot of work um, with, with the, you and the staff and you know, and it's just a great result that we can move. Like we've been in, we've been working for less than a year as a group, and we've already made some huge financial investments back in Santee and Lakeside. So I just think it's uh, it's great. Yeah, I was going to echo some of the same sentiments there, Chief. You mentioned five hundred thousand dollars coming from our EMS um, fund reserve. How much? Can you, for the community's benefit, how much is in our portion of that uh, reserve in our SLIMSA right now? Um, right now, we're about $4.3 million. Yep. So just for everybody's knowledge, almost, almost $4.5 million, $4.3 million. So we're only taking about $500,000 out of that right now. It leaves us a little under $4 million still in our reserve, which is a very healthy reserve for our emergency medical services. Like Councilwoman Koval said, it's only been less than a year since we've... Um, January, really, so got there, is that, yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, sorry, cancel woman, sorry. Um, it's only been less than a year, and, you know, talking about that, so we got the AP Triton report back in March of this year, and Chief, you did your report in April, and out of those 27 recommendations, please correct me if I'm wrong, you have already tackled 14 either completed or in progress of filling those recommendations completed. Is that correct? That is correct. So in eight months, you've done almost 50% of the recommendations completed for the AP Triton Report, Standards of Cover Service, for, for the public, sorry, and things that we've done. And additionally, looking at obviously adding a third fire station, a temporary station th right now, to better service our citizens and response times is adding the BLS units that we also got done um, too, which, which only has helped um, better do the transport and service our, our community too. So, Chief, I just want to th thank you for all your hard efforts and all everybody else. This has been a collaborative effort, like um, Captain Gerhardt mentioned, that you know this is a brilliant idea that you had and to, to pull this together and make this happen and figure out how to get this done. So I don't get to second it, but I am 100,000 million percent in, in favor of this. <laughs> This is my opportunity to oppose it. Absolutely, <laughs> I dare you. I just want to let you know you were, you know it's going to be a three-one vote. So. <laughs> you know what? This is uh, this is the fun part of our job. I want to say, and the reason why is because most everybody is in agreement on this, even with the cost of it. And when you think about a million dollars for. You know, a fire station, even if it is temporary, still has all the safety gadgets and bells and whistles that you have to have. Uh, it's really actually quite inexpensive. And um, 
Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting because when we talked so long ago about SlimSip becoming a reality, and we had to um, put somebody on that committee, and we chose, you know, both uh, Laura and Dustin. It, you never know for sure where you're going to end up. And part of that's because you don't know where the other members of that commission are going to be and what kind of influence. And I, I've only been to a couple of the meetings. I'm one of the alternates, so I don't have to go, which is kind of nice. And, uh, but when I've gone, I've watched the uh, team work. And what I do know is that uh, Dustin and um, Laura are very persuasive in their arguments towards what our needs are here in Santee. And I think part of that's because um, the other commissioners understand that once we have been able to accomplish our mission here, then we can continue to enhance and uh, do the maintenance and operations that are needed in throughout both communities, Lakeside and Santee. And so um, I want to thank the two of you for being such a good, great voice there and for helping to, uh, to get this done. And, you know, Chief, you get a lot of credit for, uh, you know, not sleeping nights and probably laying in bed thinking, oh, I got one more idea. Because <laughs> if I know you, that's probably what's happening. And a spreadsheet. And a spreadsheet. <laughs> and um, so, so the, the, the teamwork that has been done here uh, with, with everything from financing to you name it, uh, is just uh, commendable. And, um, and so I just I wanted to make sure that I publicly commended each of you for the work that you've done. And, um, and so th this actually makes the job easy for Rob and I. <laughs> we just get to push the yes button, I think. So let's go ahead and vote. Motion carries unanimously. unanimously. Councilmember Hall excused. All right, that takes us to our next round of non-agenda public comment. No speaker slips. What? No speaker. All right. Uh, let's uh, go to uh, city council reports. Uh, Vice Mayor. Oh, I do have one. <laughs> um, I'll start off with um, some of the fun stuff that happened over the, since the last council meeting, council member McNellis and Trotter and myself got to help with the tap the keg ceremony at the um, El Cajon Oktoberfest. Um, I attended on behalf of the city council the um, annual manufacturing expo and presented a proclamation on behalf of the city. It was at Grossmont College. Pam, thank you very much for bringing that to me and getting me in the right location. I was in the wrong location when I was at Grossmont College. Um, there were, obviously it was on campus, and the, if you, the manufacturing expo is like a job fair for manufacturing businesses. And um, so being at Grossmont College was really smart. It was the first time they did it there, but they also brought in 400 high school kids. And it was just it was a great event. Like, they did a wonderful job, so congratulations to the East County Economic De Development Council on that, and, um, of course, Grossmont College. Um, I attended the first annual, I hope I'm saying it right, Lo Lokahi Festival, which is the Pacific Islander Festival at um, Guardian Angels Church. Thank you. And uh, I will definitely go again. There were a lot of people there. The ceremony was great. The shopping was great. The food was great. Um, they had a beer and wine garden. I didn't participate <laughs> because I had somewhere else to be, which was the fire department open house. So I went from that to that. But I'll definitely go next year, every year. It was wonderful. The, the community, I mean, they, they just greet you with a hug, and um, I love that. So, yeah, I miss hugging. Stupid COVID. <laughs> okay. And then, yes, I did it attend um, the SANDAG meeting, and I, I brought the packet from it. It was a joint committee meeting, so it was the Transportation Committee, the Borders, which is, I'm on Borders, um, Regional Planning, and Public Safety Committees, and it was a big group of people. We did similar processes. Uh, it was for the 
you know, the 2025 plan and beyond, uh, similar to what we did on those workshops. I attended two of the workshops. I think there were a total of four um, with, with SANDAG Executive Board where, <laughs> you know, we, we fought for our ideas and, our, and the things that we wanted to see in the region. So it was, I, I don't know if fought is the right word, but influence. Advocate. Advocate, influence. I, I definitely, um, you know, they split us up into different tables and um, gave us the, the framework to work within um, my, you know, and they split up the, obviously, the, the groups. And then they split up where, where we all come from. So I was the representative, I guess, of East, well, I was at my table from East County. There was South Bay. There was actually a lot of representation from North County at my particular table, uh, which was interesting. And... Uh, it, it did give me a, a chance to chat with some people that I've really never even spoken to before. Um, so um, I definitely advocated for, at, at, at Borders Committee, I'm the East County representative, so big push once again, which I always push for, is um, improvements on the 67. It's, it's a safety issue, and, and that's what I always say. It's not, you know, we're not wanting to add a lane because... We're inconvenienced in East County. It's uh, if you're trying to get from Ramona to Lakeside in the event of a wildfire, this is a, a safety corridor issue. It's not one of those things where I could, you know, argue <laughs> with the people at the table that, look, we, we voted to tax ourselves in 1987 and we loved it so much that we voted to tax ourselves again in 2004. And, and you know, Sandeg uh, gave us this, you know, I don't know. I've been thinking about it a lot. Was it lies when they talked about what the financing was? Or was it, um, you know, the union control that have come into these contracts, the sole source contracts that we're, you know, Sandag is able to do, which no other public agency would be able to do what they've been doing for decades. And, and you know, with 90% of people in, const or, yeah, 90% of companies in construction being private, the unions are the ones that control it. And, and those contracts can cost three times as much. So, you know, maybe the estimates were right when it wasn't control when these contracts weren't controlled in the way that they're controlled now. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but that was a, that was a tangent for me. But anyway, um, I advocated for the 67 and I advocated for the 52. And that's my Santee hat. Um, I talked about, um, you know, we talked about managed lane, and they said, you know, they talked about, well, you know, there's got to be funding for that. And I said, no, we, we're we working. We, we don't think we can count on Sandeg. We've known this for a long time for the 52. Um, we, we definitely want their help, but we don't, we don't believe we can count on it. So we've been working on other options. One of those, of course, was approving Finita Ranch, and, you know, we've, we loved it so much we approved it twice, but a condition of that is expanding, not adding another lane, but changing the, the how the lanes, um, the, design. the design, and that's, that. I told the table, we still want to move forward with that, and then the other thing with the 67, I, I feel is just owed to the people. Um, the only other idea I had, um, because they asked for, you know, ideas that promote uh, reducing greenhouse gas and this and that, the other thing, and safety. Um, so I s said maybe we could um, have a e-bike rebate for high school kids so they could, because Sandag actually proposed e-bike rebates, so I said, well... There's a, a problem that the representative from, uh, it was the vice mayor, I think, from Encinitas said that they have an issue with the e-bikes and the, you know, they've got a lot of bike lanes up there and so they have a lot of safety issues. So now that their, um, their public safety will cite basically teenagers who are, who are doing unsafe things on their e-bikes and the citation is basically making them go to a, a, a safety course, which you know, that makes sense. So maybe through the rebate program, we could just make it a condition that they take the safety course in order to get the rebate, and we, you know, wrap that all into one thing. But then also, you know, I said we need to do something at the high schools if we're going to have these expensive e-bikes parking at high schools 
to make sure that they're secure there so we don't have a theft issue as well. So that was my only give on <laughs> their philosophy. Um, but the, other, the only other things I advocated for were the 67 and the 52. And then uh, somebody at my table, when we were doing the monopoly money part, which you know what that is, that's very funny. Uh, mm -hmm. And there was kind of a consensus, well, that means we're going to need a tax measure to fund this. I was like, no, 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 we're not putting any of my monopoly money on these projects I'm advocating for. Uh, because I, I do feel we are still owed from 1987 and 2004 the things we were promised. And that concludes my report. Well, Dustin. Yes, sir. So I uh, just wanted to let you guys know that my uh, meet Mission Trails Regional Task Force um, meeting, um, we brought up uh, the Rangers at, there, brought up some issues that Mission Trails is starting to have a much more uptick in homeless um, within, the, within the grounds there. Um, and so I you know, asked some general questions, obviously in camp-ins or just people hanging out with the restroom, charging phones, what kind of thing. So all of the above. Um, so some of the, they think they're attributed to it's the city of San Diego's uh, no camp in ordinance. Um, obviously, we have council members from the uh, city of San Diego on there, too. So they got to hear this, but it's starting to impact Mission Trails, which obviously gets closer to our, our borders. So bring it up to you guys. Uh, we, did, we did get some fun stuff done the last couple of weeks, too. So like uh, the councilwoman just mentioned... Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I did that on purpose, but okay, that's okay. Uh, the Councilman McNellis and I got a chance to go up to Camp Pendleton last uh, Friday and hang out with um, some Marines up there. They're getting ready to go on deployment, this uh, particular battalion, and we got to go up there and see some of the training that they've had over the last year before they head out to deployment. We got to do some of the... the um, exercises and trainings that they actually do during their during their training and stuff so it was kind of cool to spend a day up there at Camp Pendleton or half a day or so um, last Saturday I went and did the tree planting at Weston Park uh, along with the council too I planted and, more. yeah I don't think so Sam <laughs> Probably. Don't, don't, don't get into it <laughs> and then last I, I also attended the fire um, department's open house at uh, station four which was very well attended I mean I, I'm not joking, you guys. There's thousands of people that, that walk through those doors in, in that four hours or whatever it was. Uh, very, very well attended. And then I'll just give a plug to Garden Angels. This weekend is the fall festival, so a three-day weekend. There is a beer garden there. You can come hang out and, and uh, spend some money at uh, Garden Angels Church this weekend. Have a little fun. So, <laughs> Sounds good. Councilman McNellis. It's already been all been said, and I did plant more trees. All right. <laughs> I've been there before. I know he can run that shovel. So, um, for me, uh, I really don't have no one can like a Mexican because uh, I've been out of town the last 15 days. It was nice. The one thing I did notice is uh, that um, some of those places I was uh, in the East Coast and uh, the Midwest uh, seem to have a lot better handle on their streets and roads. Um, you know, no offense here to, to our staff or anything, but these companies that we're hiring, I think they can do a better job because, um, yeah, they lay down the asphalt and stuff, but it's they might as well, you know, just not done anything because it's still, you know, rough enough to break a tooth. And um, back there, they are so smooth. I don't know what they do differently. But they are so smooth, it's unbelievable. You can't even hear your tires bounce on that, you know, pavement. And um, they do, they work all the time. I can't believe it. Even in the snow. I don't know how they do it. And they're still in great condition. So, I don't know, I just say that because uh, maybe we can ask these people better, you know, how, how do you, you know, where's their experience? You know, how come they don't get them straighter, flatter, and, you know, whatever. I don't know. I'm just kind of, that's my tangent. Okay. So, so that's all I really have. Uh, city manager. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just one real quick note for the community. The Brews and Vice Festival is coming up on October 21st. You can still get full tickets for $60, get you in 530 to 830. It's a great event with beverage samples and food samples. 
But for those of you that want to look at a cheaper option, we do have now a bite size ticket. The bite size ticket lets you in an hour later, so you don't get the premium action when you go in to meet the vendors and get your samples, but you still get a commemorative cup. And it's $35 for a regular attendee and $20 for a designated driver. And in the event you don't want to worry, you, you do worry about taking care of your kids at night, uh, we have that covered. Our staff has worked out a youth program with the YMCA so that we've got babysitting services and activities so you can go have a parent's night out. Just a note, if you haven't anything to do on October 21st, full-size ticket, bite-size ticket, kids are covered. It's a great event. Have fun, and we'll see you on the 21st. City Attorney. No report. All right. Well, we're going to um, go into closed session to handle our special meeting. So that concludes, well, I won't say concludes this uh, portion of the meeting yet, because I'll close the meeting after we come back out. Thank you, everybody, for your patience.
All right. Let the uh, record reflect that uh, we met in closed session on the special uh, agenda tonight, and uh, direction was given to staff. And with that, both meetings are adjourned. <laughs>